What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of The Arnie's. We are three masked vigilantes that consider each other to be BFFs with nothing better to do. I'm Matt Johnson, and thank God we don't have a vigilante type in our friend group. I'm Keith Baker, and I had a mullet as a kid. And I'm Austin Terry, and there is absolutely a wrong time to rock. On today's show, we'll be talking about Peacemaker's full season over on HBO Max now that the finale has aired. But before we return to the troubled shores that are the DCEU, emphasis on troubled, guys, how would you end up in Task Force X? I would just be some random guy probably just walking by. And they're like, <laughs> Yeah, it was just an accident. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, you want to join our task force? I think I would have to do possibly in the world of the DCEU the most dangerous vile and evil thing one can do and it would be the fact that i would have to hold court a little bit and tell the world that i kind of liked wonder woman 1984 and i think i would probably be put away by that uh by the dceu fans and i'd probably end up on the suicide squad team because of it i'd probably be put away by the snyder cut fans for campaigning for the weeding cut <laughs> you weren't being serious, at least. So let's make sure let's make sure that's clear that you weren't being serious when you said that. <laughs> so with that, let's go ahead and get into the main topic of today's show. James Gunn, the creative force behind Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, made his way over to the DC film universe last year with his version of The Suicide Squad. Despite low box office returns, partly due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the film actually received very positive reviews from fans and critics alike. The cast and Gunn took center stage when it came to all the praise, and while John Cena was praised for his role and portrayal of the jingoistic killer Peacemaker, I feel like several fans, definitely myself included, were a little bit confused when Gunn kind of announced out of nowhere that he was working on a spin-off series focusing on the character. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but he was extremely hard to root for in the Suicide Squad, killed a character that we all really liked, and now within just a few months of his movie being released, he has to lead his own show. I had no idea how that was going to work, and I was hopeful because I liked James Gunn, but, I mean, it sounded like a weird-ass idea. Alas, here we are, having seen all of season one of Peacemaker on HBO Max, and this time around, he is on his own journey to right some of his wrongs while being a part of a brand new team on a dangerous mission. And since James Gunn wrote the whole series and directed most of the episodes, there are sure to be some laughs and tears along the way. So, Austin and Keith... Remind me how you felt about James Gunn writing style and the character of Peacemaker in The Suicide Squad, and then I want to hear your non-spoiler thoughts on the series Peacemaker now that we've seen the finale. Yeah, I thought Peacemaker in The Suicide Squad was uh, was really used in a smart way. I thought James Gunn really took the idea of a douchey Captain America and kind of took that to heart and made him like a really fun, but still hard to root for character in The Suicide Squad. And I think I was kind of in the same boat as you, Matt, had it into the show, was I just wasn't sure how they were going to do an entire show around this character. And I think the best thing I can say about this show is I had a lot of fun with it. Um, I think the first half of it is definitely a lot stronger than the latter half of the show. Um, I do think it loses some of its momentum once the full mystery gets revealed and it kind of fails to do anything new for me in kind of the last final episodes. Once you learn the whole plot, the story's a bit predictable. But at the end of the day, the characters stayed really fun. Uh, the soundtrack's great. And there's some kick-ass action in there, too. So overall, I, I had a good time with Peacemaker on HBO Max. To be honest, I can't remember anything about his character in Suicide Squad. After finishing the show, really made me want to go back and rewatch it. I think John Cena really held his own. I mean, leading the show, uh, he's hilarious. I found myself laughing out loud a lot throughout the whole watch. Uh, I think the team showed a pretty cool chemistry. kind of gave me a boys kind of vibe to it. The story was overall pretty fun but I found it to be kind of sporadic and kind of all over the place at times. Leading up to the end, I think it wrapped up in kind of a cool way, but there was definitely some stuff that I was left really confused about, so maybe you guys can help me fill in the gaps later. Um, but overall, it kind of just made me want to go back and rewatch Suicide Squad because I just completely forgot about this character. Yeah, I think the best thing I can say about the show is that now, after having seen all eight episodes, I can really appreciate the hurdles James Gunn put himself through with kind of creating this show because he was such a hard character to root for. And by the end, I really fell in love with Peacemaker, I think in part due to John Cena's performance, but definitely in large part due to the writing and the character arc that they gave him. I mean, he's a super easy character to root for by the end. And at the end of the Suicide Squad, I remember being mad that they had a post credit scene where he survived. I was like, oh, God, come on. So stupid. I don't like this guy. Uh, so, yeah, I think they really took us on a great, you know, character kind of driven journey in this show. 
I thought it was super funny when it needed to be. I like that James Gunn wasn't restricted by a rating, which is you know the same positive I could give the Suicide Squad. It's fun seeing him with an R rating. And I mean, again, the violence is very over the top um, and bloody and gory, but it's always somehow engaging to watch and even at times funny, which is a hard thing to do. But yeah, everything you guys said, I agree with the team dynamics as well really help carry us through. I think there's tons of fun characters to shout out that we'll get to in just a little bit. And yeah, overall, the series definitely surprised me. I kind of going in, I expected the laughs and I expected the gore, but I did not expect that character arc that I talked about. And I definitely didn't expect a bunch of like kind of pulling at the heartstrings moments, like not even just with Peacemaker, but there was some emotional moments throughout this show that I didn't expect. And yeah, I gosh, I went from not wanting to watch this show at all. And they announced it to I can't wait for more. Yeah, I think the side characters they surrounded John Cena with really helped flesh out this character and, and give him just fun characters to bounce off of. I think the biggest issue I have with the show is I think a lot of times it, it struggles with always needing to go for the comedic jokes. And I don't think all the jokes hit in this show. I think sometimes it's like joke after joke after joke when they probably could be doing more character development or more kind of fleshing out the story a bit more. That's kind of like a nitpicky thing, though. I think I'm totally in line with you guys. Uh, this show was a surprise and a ton of fun each week. I was going to save it for a little bit later, but since it's not spoilery, I'll just say it now. Um, I don't know if I had an issue with like the joke writing, per se, if that makes sense. As the episodes went on, the thing that I was finding myself having an issue with is if you look at any of the comedies he's done, John Cena is a really good improviser. But in most of those movies, you know, they're like an hour and a half or two hours. So like they're cut down, like he'll make a joke, he'll find a bit and then we move on. For whatever reason, maybe it's because it was an eight episode show like, man, uh, John Cena and Freddie Stroma were just not edited at all. They were just improvising for minutes on end. And I got to say, I mean, as much as I like those actors, they they drove jokes into the ground that by the end, it was like not funny. It's, it's just like them listing things like listing names or like vigilante. You're an idiot. Like, how would you even think that? That's such a dumb thing to say. What do you mean, peacemaker? Like, no, here's why I think that. And it's like, God, what a fucking idiot. How could you think that? And then it's just like, OK, and they just keep going back and forth. So I think the improv gave us some great moments in this show, but they should have edited it a bit more because at times they just went on for so long. And that was the low points of the comedy for me in the season. That's a better way of phrasing how I was kind of getting at is I, maybe it's not the fact that there's too many jokes, but they definitely let the jokes go on way too long in this show. Um, and I guess something else worth mentioning here before we get into spoilers is uh, this show's not super connected to the broader DCEU. Um, obviously, it's DC characters, but the rest of the DC universe doesn't really play a role here. Were you guys happy about that? Were you happy to just get a story or do you wish we had some more threads to the DC universe? I don't know. I guess I'm kind of indifferent. Maybe later on, it'd be cool. Uh, for this first season, though, I think they did a good job. I think this would have been a weird show if we had not gotten the Suicide Squad movie beforehand. Like if James Gunn had announced this random like D-list DC character that he wanted to do an HBO Max show about. And then this is what we had gotten. I think that would have been a little strange, but it feels very connected to the Suicide Squad and those events. So in that way, it feels like a natural continuation and all that fun stuff. And I think we'll get some more interesting stuff in the future. So I think at this point, you know, I've long accepted that. We have multiple Jokers with like Jared Leto and Joaquin Phoenix at the same time. We have the Ben Affleck Batman. We're about to get Robert Pattinson. And it's all like this DC extended universe thing. So I don't really care so much anymore if it connects to the larger thing. Just tell a good story. But that being said, whenever they did connect to stuff, I was like, oh, that's cool. So, yeah, I think overall I was happy with how it was connected. All right, Matt, what should be journey on into spoiler territory? Yeah, let's go ahead and get into it. I think... Uh, kind of like we've been tiptoeing around, there was a lot that surprised us in this show. And at least for me, a lot of that had to do with some story beats and some twists and turns. So definitely, even though it's mostly a comedy, there is tons of spoilery stuff to get into. So if you have not finished all eight episodes of Peacemaker, go back to HBO Max, check those out, and then come on back to our episode. We'll be waiting for you. So, just to catch everybody up, after recovering from the injuries he suffered during the events of the Suicide Squad, Christopher Smith, aka Peacemaker, is forced to join the mysterious Argus Black Ops Squad, Project Butterfly. They are on a mission to identify and eliminate parasitic butterfly-like creatures in human form in the U.S. and around the world. 
and Peacemaker is, of course, created and written by Mr. James Gunn, who is returning from the Suicide Squad. Uh, Fun fact, Gunn actually wrote the entire first season in eight weeks during quarantine for COVID. Um, Out of sheer boredom, he did not actually believe that the series would ever get picked up. Uh, This season saw episodes directed by Jody Hill, Rosemary Rodriguez, Brad Anderson, and James Gunn himself. And our score is composed by Clint Mansell and Kevin Kiner. They're both award-winning composers that have worked on other DC shows like Titans and Doom Patrol in the past. Uh, We also have the theme song, Do You Want to Taste It? by Wig Wham. And of course, based on characters from DC Comics. All right. And going into our cast, we have John Cena as Christopher Smith, Peacemaker. Daniel Brooks as Laota Adebayo. Freddie Stroma as Adrian Chase, Vigilante. Chukwudi Uwuji as Mern. Jennifer Holland as Amelia Harcourt. Steve Agui as John Economist. Annie Chang as Sophie Song, Lachlan Murnau as Larry Fitzgibbon, and we got Robert Patrick as Augie Smith, White Dragon. And we also have Viola Davis returning as Amanda Waller. In a fun twist, we also have Jason Momoa and Ezra Miller returning as the Aquaman and the Flash. We haven't seen them in major roles since 2017 for Miller and 2018 for Momoa, not counting the unreleased footage of the Snyder Cut from last year. This, along with their upcoming sequels, seem to confirm that they will be the future of whatever the live-action Justice League ends up being. Yeah, unfortunately, the shadowy figures of Henry Cavill and Gal Gadot do not appear to be playing into that future for the DCEU. (laughs) Well, they were there, at least, so maybe there's still hope that Henry Cavill could show up again at some (laughs) point. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I think I'll give my highlight. Um, Of course, John Cena's a highlight. He did a way better job carrying the show than I expected from him, but I think I got to give my highlight to Freddie Storma as Adrian Chase or Vigilante. Uh, this guy just had me laughing, I think, the most out of anybody in this show. He definitely wears you down a bit with some of his uh, improv with John Cena. But overall, I had a great time with this character, and they definitely fleshed them out based on what the source material is for this guy. I'm going to go ahead and go with Steve Agee as John Economist. <laughs> this guy made me laugh <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> and I know it, maybe at times he probably shouldn't have, but I just liked his anger the entire time with everybody. Just how frustrated <laughs> he was. <laughs> just cracking me up. He has just... I don't, it's not necessarily line delivery. It's just the choice of words. Like, <laughs> yeah. because one of my favorite jokes in the show was like Freddie Stroma being like, we're going to go out there and kick some ass just like Butch Cassidy and Sundance. And anybody could have just said, they died. But <laughs> John Economos going, um, they died at the end of that film. <laughs> Something about <laughs> the choice of words there yeah. made me laugh so hard. I guess I'd fill out the rest of the team. I thought Danielle Brooks, Chuck Woody Awuji, and Jennifer Holland kind of filling out Project Butterfly. Super good. Danielle Brooks in particular, kind of her burgeoning friendship and how she's kind of open to Peacemaker, I think made her a highlight of the show. But my main one, I guess I have to credit a bunch of different people. Probably James Gunn, since he's so inclined for this kind of thing, making the call. And then the choreographer for whoever put the theme song for Peacemaker together. The opening of this show, it's pitch perfect. It's like one of the few times I've ever like sat through an entire intro every episode. (laughs) So 80s. Just made me laugh so hard. (laughs) All right. So with that, let's go ahead and dive deeper into detail and get into our in-depth freeform discussion. I'll start us off as usual with our general thoughts. So did you guys have any standout points about the season that we haven't already mentioned? I kind of want to get your guys' thoughts on what you thought we were going to get from this show um, after finishing the Suicide Squad, and then like kind of juxtaposing that against what we actually ended up getting in the show. I guess I thought it was going to be more connected to Suicide Squad in the sense that Amanda Waller would be more involved and the whole him having to go back to prison might come up at some point. Yeah, I think um, based on the trailers and stuff, I kind of just assumed that this would be focusing, I, I guess... Overall, there's one difference and something I didn't expect, but for the most part, this is kind of what I assumed it would be, just better, Um, because I knew it was going to be funny. I knew he was going to be part of a new team that largely consisted of the people behind the scenes from the Suicide Squad, like that team that was working with Amanda Waller. But I guess I kind of thought it would be like them going on various missions, and then over the course of the episodes... We would start to see more character development and softening of Peacemaker's character to kind of, I guess, show him a tone for his past. But I didn't expect like the deeper dive and the flashbacks into that character and the father son relationship. I I didn't expect that going in as a way to kind of show how this character was raised to become who he became. And then 
probably the biggest thing that I had no idea about was the fact this whole Project Butterfly angle was going to end up becoming a way bigger part of the show than I thought it would be. And I definitely have some nitpicks with it here and there, but uh, overall, I thought it was a pretty fun element that the characters even joked about how it kind of tied in with the kaiju element from the Suicide Squad. So I liked that it was weirdly kind of similar. It was kind of fun. Yeah, I definitely thought Amanda Waller would play a larger role in this show, um, especially because it seemed like they had some history in the Suicide Squad movie. I also did not expect that Project Butterfly. Like, I didn't think the show was going to be one long mission. I kind of right. thought it would be a series of missions, like mm-hmm. kind of you said that. Um, I thought there would be more ties to not the Suicide Squad movie, but just the actual Suicide Squad itself in general. I got to say, uh, you saying that kind of reminded me of something kind of general that I thought was so funny and, and so, such a weird choice, but a good one. I don't know how you guys felt about it, but I liked how this show, while it was kind of 80s in terms of its music and you know, like some characters and storytelling, like cliches and all that. Some of its superhero stuff, if you want to call it that, was very modern. But then some of it, you just get these weird bursts of like the classic 60s cartoons, like seeing Peacemaker show up to his dad's house and he's just like, I need a new helmet. And he's like, come on in. And then his dad just like presses a few buttons and in his house, it just opens up this weird interdimensional portal and they walk into like Peacemaker's Batcave, essentially, and they don't treat it as being weird. It's just like, okay, I'm here to get my helmet. Like, so, so fun. I really like that kind of stuff. And then even the simpler things like this guy, for Christ's sakes, has a literal sidekick that's just an eagle. (laughs) So I liked kind of like the more weird throwback type superhero tropes that we haven't seen in a while and definitely not in live action. Did you want more, though, from like how they got that tech? I think they call it like a quantum room. I guess that's what I I mean. I wanted a bit more backstory there of like why we have this. Right. I guess that's what I mean, that I didn't really care that they didn't tell us like how his dad built that or made it like it would have been funny if they had, but it didn't bother me that they didn't go into it at all. So why does this KKK leader? (laughs) I I don't don't know. Shit either. No idea. (laughs) So weird. That is actually kind of something I I wanted more of from the show is uh, I kind of wanted more of like what his dad had him up to throughout his career and and i, I kind of wanted a bit more backstory of i guess just like how he ended up on task force x and like what stuff he'd done in the past yeah it's mostly just said through dialogue i, I after we got some flashbacks i was wondering if we would get more but um yeah it was okay i think they gave us enough but yeah i, I agree it would have been kind of interesting to tie it into the beginning of suicide squad a bit looking at where peacemaker was at the end of the suicide squad and now looking where he's at at the end of this show kind of that character journey which of course ties into him getting closer with these people also reconciling his relationship with his father which isn't a traditional thing in terms of how they reconcile it but do you feel that overall this was a pretty satisfying character arc because i really do believe that is kind of the heart of this show if that hadn't worked then i think the show really would have fell flat because We didn't go into the show liking him, so if they hadn't nailed that, then it almost would have felt pointless. I think I would actually say, for me, he has almost too much of an arc in this show. Um, The the version of Peacemaker that's presented to us in the Suicide Squad is the guy who's willing to get peace at every cost. And I I get that's part of his arc in this actual show, but I think for me, they kind of got too far away from that aspect of the character. I think he almost ends up as too reformed by the by the time the credits roll on season one of Peacemaker. In the sense that he's not like a mercenary anymore or that he's like too much of a mercenary? I think he ends as too much of a on the hero side of things. And I, I kind of want, I like oh. him more as a mercenary who um, can be darker when he needs to be. I mean, at the end of the day, he still is this incredibly violent person and they don't really ever get him to change that. So he's still definitely a dick also, which I really like. He's still an ass. But uh, yeah, it just seems like his values have changed a little bit. And there were some interesting kind of tidbits throughout the show that left me questioning things because like, I agree with you uh, at the start of the show, it's like, how am I going to root for this guy? And then as the episodes go on, it's like, yeah, I mean, he was this weird mercenary, like, like you said, peace at any cost. And they're not really diving into that. So But I'm like, well, I mean, we did see him go through a lot of trauma in the Suicide Squad. I mean, he killed Rick Flagg, who he idolized. And then now here he is after all that's happened and he regrets it. You kind of get the feeling that he hasn't regretted a lot of things that he's done up until this point. So I can understand why he's different in the show. But then there were also some lines here and there that had me questioning things like the characters are always like bringing up his file that they read. And 
talking about some things he had done in the past and people he had killed. And I don't know how you guys felt, but there were some hints. Maybe I read it wrong, but like, of course, the iconic line, like, I'll kill any man, woman or child to achieve peace, no matter the cost. Now, I wonder if that's even the case. Like, I don't get the feeling that he's ever killed children. Like, whenever he's tasked with killing the butterfly children for the first time, like, he can't do it. And then he keeps having lines with Mern, like, I don't kill a child that you tell me to kill. Like, I don't know. It just seems like, I don't know, maybe they were kind of playing with, maybe that was just something he said to make himself sound cool. I don't know if he ever actually did some of the, like the more horrific things that we expected him to have based on the Suicide Squad. I think what you're getting at is also kind of what I'm getting at is, is the peacemaker we saw in the Suicide Squad movie, I can believe has done that stuff, killed women and children to get all of it. But but the peacemaker presented to us in this show, I think is a lot more softer than what they initially went for in the movie. Yeah, mm. I can agree with that. And you felt that like from the outset, it's not because like he changed, it was maybe the change was just too fast, like you said. Yeah, I mean, I felt it from the time the show starts because almost we very quickly flash back to him killing Rick Flag, and you can tell he regrets it. And I didn't really get a sense of regret from the movie. They've definitely fleshed oh, yeah. it out more in the show. But I, I kind of liked where we ended with the movie of he's just a guy that's going to do what it takes to accomplish the mission. Like, I, I was really interested to explore that part of Peacemaker. I wasn't necessarily looking for like another. Uh, somewhat bad hero to reform like i just wasn't really interested in like that type of story seeing again and yeah it's interesting yeah i think maybe we just took different things from it because i like the character arc i can definitely agree that at times it moved too quickly but when it comes to like achieving peace at any cost and keith you already talked about the butterfly story that i know we'll get into but i mean those final moments i mean the butterflies basically lay out that their motivation is very reminiscent to peacemakers like we're here to walk you through this because you're incapable. We want to save the humans at any cost. And then like Peacemaker's flashing back to like the vows he made. And then at that moment, like it's almost like a Last of Us type thing. I mean, he theoretically potentially dooms Earth, which he even references like, did I, did that decision to kill the cow, like, you know, like fuck up like the planet? Are we doomed? And it's like, he's giving us free will as opposed to being dominated by these butterflies that might save the Earth, but then we don't have any you know, freedom of choice. So I don't know. It's kind of interesting because by the end, I did feel like he achieved the mission. He accomplished the goal at literally any cost. Like, I mean, flash forward a few thousand years in this world and maybe because he killed the butterflies, uh, you know, we're doomed. But yeah, I guess I was okay with keeping that mentality of Peacemaker and also getting the arc along the way. And like I said, it definitely was maybe a bit too fast at times. Let's go ahead and bring the rest of the team that we've already mentioned into it, talk about some of the general Project Butterfly team dynamics, and let's start with the one that we have already brought up, Peacemaker and Vigilante, a kind of one-sided BFF relationship, you might say. How'd that work for you guys? What'd you think? They have some of the weirdest interactions where like, you definitely buy that Vigilante cares a lot more about Peacemaker than Peacemaker does about Vigilante, but then at the same time, like, they have these sweet interactions that are still pretty dark. The scene whenever Peacemaker can't take the shot on the first Butterfly family. It's a very dark scene that somehow is also like very weirdly sweet coming from Vigilante's side of things too. So for a while I thought it was just going to be kind of played for laughs, but by the time the show actually wrapped up, I actually did buy that these two could um, be friends and like hang out outside of the Butterfly missions. I liked Vigilante. He was goofy and kind of innocent most of the time. Kind of makes you wonder like where, how did this guy become who he is? I don't know. I mean, I don't know what you want to call this version of Vigilante because he's a, either a sociopath or a psychopath. I mean, he's something on that spectrum. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you're right. They did find a way to make him kind of endearing despite his actions because um, it's like he's a goofier guy. But at the outset, they kind of set up that maybe he was a bit more indiscriminate with his actions in the past. Like, you know, he talks about how the law is basically his Bible and like, Whenever there's a scene where they have the threesome and then they're smoking weed, he's like, you know, a couple of years ago, I would have killed you guys for that. And it's like, oh, OK. <laughs> so <laughs> there's these weird moments. But yeah, definitely the sweetness does shine through. I kind of already mentioned it. But I mean, he literally gets himself put into prison just so he can kill Peacemaker's father. So which, again, very dark thing. But he genuinely believes that it will help Peacemaker, who's his friend. So he's like, I'll do that. And then whenever it goes wrong, he has like a 
a breakdown about it. It's definitely the most emotional we see him throughout the entire show. So, of course, just like from like a basic kind of tropey perspective, you do at times want to like have a moment where maybe Peacemaker like hugs Vigilante and he's like, you know, man, I know I give you a lot of shit, but you are my buddy. I do love you. And it's like, wow. But I kind of like that we never got that um, because I think it would have been a bit goofy. I kind of like where we left things. It's like Vigilante (laughs) just is that like he just loves Peacemaker. And over the course of the show, I think we saw Peacemaker feel a lot more comfortable with him. And I I agree with you. At the end of this, I think they're going to hang out for sure. I, I love seeing the scene like in the montage at the end, whenever they're actually having fun blowing shit up together. Whereas in like the pilot, it was kind of like a vigilante was excited about it. And Peacemaker was just like, okay, I guess we can go shoot stuff. But like they were having like this amazing time. So yeah, I, I can't wait to see that relationship uh, kind of go even further in the future. I did like at the end though, too, Peacemaker clarifies with Adebayo that number one is so Eagly, funny. number two is Adebayo, and number three is vigilante. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, I mean... But that's James Gunn for you, because we literally saw a grown man tell a grown woman that after his pet eagle, she's not his best friend, his BFF. And she gets emotional over that. (laughs) And then we, the audience, are kind of like, wow, that was a really sweet moment. (laughs) That should be stupid (laughs) as shit. But it was so good. Speaking about a bio, what do you think of this uh, character beyond the Jelanti? This is our, our other kind of new introduction to the team from the Suicide Squad movie. I thought Adebayo and, and Peacemaker's relationship was really great in the show, but seeing her as like a direct descendant of Amanda Waller and maybe be, having been raised by Amanda Waller, that's the one aspect of the character that didn't really work for me in this one, because I feel like she's too nice to be that close to Amanda Waller. They kind of like played it, though, as if they had a strange relationship, I guess. So They also, the thing I liked is that she's a really nice person and not at all like Amanda Waller, but she, like it or not, is absolutely capable of manipulation, just like her mother. Watching her, even though she didn't want to, I don't even know if she was very conscious of what she was doing, but she very easily convinced uh, Vigilante to go kill Peacemaker's dad in prison because I just, I'm tired of seeing Christopher get held back. So while she is nice, and at t- times you're like, oh yeah, she is her daughter, I forgot about that. I do like that she is very capable of that classic Amanda Waller uh, using of people manipulation type thing. That's a good point. And her uh, action scene in the final episode was pretty badass oh, that too. Was so fun. <laughs> yeah. Just screaming and shooting double pistols. This show has some really top notch explosions too. Like that sonic boom thing looked great. And seeing that like racist Nazi guy like get exploded inside it was like really satisfying. Always feels good watching those Nazis blow up. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Nazis, we got to get into Peacemaker's father. Uh, the White Dragon. Was not expecting Robert Patrick to be in the show at all, but that dude is he's so random. He's in almost everything. Just playing random kind of guys like that, kind of redneck dudes or rougher kind of characters. Yeah, I, I really liked this character, not obviously as a person, but just as like a storytelling device. I thought he was a great addition because just from the first talk with um his son, it's not immediately apparent that he's a racist or a white supremacist. It just seems like he's kind of an asshole. So whenever you're first watching, it's like, oh, okay, I guess they're doing that to show, oh, this is why Peacemaker's an asshole, because he grew up with a dad who was an asshole. But then they slowly start peeling it back. And you kind of think more about that scene whenever he was telling his story of the events of the Suicide Squad and how this black guy uh, got the better of him. And it's like, that doesn't immediately scream weird. But then watching Robert Patrick just burst out laughing at the thought of like a black man getting killed by his son is like, oh, Jesus. And then it just goes even further and further from there. And then it's not you don't look at it as like, oh, this is why Peacemaker's an asshole. Then after a few episodes, it becomes more about, OK, this is why he has such this warped, gross, racist view of America and really kind of brought up the whole nature versus nurture debate. This guy would have been a normal guy had he not been raised by this you know piece of shit. So, yeah, I actually really thought the father son dynamic was very powerful in the show and i really loved where it ended i didn't like how it ended with like fuck you dad I, I can't stand what you did to me like i'm gonna put you away i don't know this was like one of the rare times where like a killing felt like the right decision and you see what it did to him as a character so yeah robert patrick was great really liked this addition to the show yeah this was actually the story i was the most interested in in the show even more so than the butterflies i just I was very curious about this dynamic and how this impacted Peacemaker's childhood and, of course, like why he is the way he is today. Um, I really wanted to know like more about 
what the White Dragon had. I mean, it's pretty clear what he'd been doing for his career, but I want to know like why he has all this tech and why he has this suit and like what he was actually raising Peacemaker to do and, and why Peacemaker has all of his tech too. I This was the stuff that I wanted more of um, in a good way though. Like what they gave us, I thought was great, um, but it's definitely stuff I would love to like flash back to more in the future and see what more of um, Peacemaker's childhood was like being raised under the White Dragon. And I mean, it looks like we might get it with them ending off with his dad's spirit or whatever, sitting with him on the porch that his dad's still going to be involved in his life. But I was not expecting that turn, that quick, very quick turn into the, his dad being a full on racist. When it, when it, whenever his dad first came into the picture, I was like, oh, his dad's just going to be like that old man, like gun guru. He's going to go to if he needs something uh, like tech wise. What do you guys think of like his suit? Because they kept teasing that for the whole season and we only got it for like one sequence. Were you wanting more from that aspect of his character? I was fine with it. I mean, it definitely looked pretty menacing whenever they were just like looking at it in the past episodes. But then when he eventually puts it on, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, shit's about to go down because we know he wants to kill Peacemaker. So I didn't really look at it in terms of like how cool it looked or like what it could do that was like power wise interesting. I just, it was almost like a, like a snap. It was like, okay, he's putting the suit on. Now he's really going to stop talking about killing Peacemaker, but he's actually going to try and do it. It was more of like a scary moment whenever they finally got to that. I was like, "Uh uh-oh, not sure how this is going to go. Like I said earlier, I definitely have some questions regarding the butterflies and the whole mission behind the butterflies. And I guess it kind of stems from the end, whenever the butterflies are explaining their motivations and all that. I guess I must have missed a couple lines, just didn't hear it or whatever. What exactly happens if they preserve the cow? How is the world saved? I kind of got lost in this. The world's not saved from the cow. The world's saved because then the butterflies can continue to live on Earth, and so they can keep influencing society to um, reverse the effects of climate change and our current like political environment. The cow is just producing; it just produces their food so they can stay alive, so that, like Austin said, they can accomplish their goal. Because whenever we first met the butterflies, they had taken over like that senator dude or whoever that was. So like. They're just trying to get into high positions of power so that they can, in their warped mind, save Earth from like stupid people in power making decisions that will impact us negatively, that will lead to our extinction. Because I guess the implication was that's the exact same thing that happened on the butterflies' home world. They watched people in power make the wrong choice that led to their downfall, so they escaped to Earth, and now they're trying to... Again, it's like this warped view of justice and like peace, you know, obviously, like they said, which is like, well, it doesn't benefit us. We want to save humanity because we don't want to let you make the same mistakes we did. So it's kind of like a noble cause. But then you have people like Mern who are like, yeah, but I know I'm a butterfly, but you can't kill all these people in the process. So, yeah, so that's kind of what I took from it, at least. I did kind of want to know more about Mern's relationship with the rest of the butterflies. It's very cool that he is like a guy that kind of defected from what the rest of his um, homeworld people were doing. The time from the reveal of him being a butterfly to his death is very short. And I kind of wanted more of knowing he's a butterfly, like seeing his interaction with the team. It was it was kind of I like the concept of the butterflies, how they take over people. I mean, they pretty much killed them by, I guess, eating their brain and all that. Yeah, I, I liked it, too. I think it by the end, it felt a bit more dynamic than how it was when it started out. It's just like this kind of typical feeling alien invasion story. There's actually more to it, which I really appreciated. And I love that their goal directly tied into Peacemaker's supposed goal to achieve peace at any cost. I like that they found a weird way to show similarities between this queen of this parasitic butterfly alien to John Cena. <laughs> so you never would have expected that. And that was cool. Um, and then, like I mean, like you said, I mean, it was... I really liked how they set up how a butterfly like infects its host. And it kind of just is like, okay, so what does that actually look like? And then you have the cop characters, uh, Sophie and Larry Fitzgibbon, who like, you know, it's the kind of thing that we don't want them to catch Peacemaker because we're starting to like Peacemaker, but they're still good people. Like you like them, they're doing their job and they're trying to do it well. But watching them get brutally like taken over by the butterfly and then we just it's like you forget oh yeah that person's dead like we can stop the butterflies at this point but that you know those cops are always going to be dead it's like kind of really dark and scary so i liked how the butterflies just these small like innocent looking creatures like were literally murdering people and taking over their bodies 
I thought the motivations of the butterflies became really interesting, especially when you hear it from Goff, their queen. But I did think like the exposition at the end of how out of nowhere, it's all about climate change and the current political environment and all that. Like I'm all for the message there, but it did kind of seem to come out of nowhere in the show. Like it just felt like something that just kind of got thrown in there at the end that wasn't really developed from the rest of the show. Hmm. I guess it's just because of the characters that we met, because I, I don't blame Mern so much because he was the one butterfly defector. So despite what the butterfly's goal is, his thing was always like, they're killing, you know, whatever the number is, like hundreds of thousands or maybe more like innocent people and like taking them over and making decisions they never would have never would have made. So I kind of like that that was the thing that Mern focused in on, which you can't really blame him for. Um, but I still hear you. You know, it did feel a little bit too exposition-y at the end there. But at the very least, you know, there are things that tie back. Like we said, the first like major butterfly we meet is a U.S. senator. And it's like, oh, so why is he like a butterfly? What's the deal with that? And then, of course, by the end, it kind of like makes it go, oh, OK. So, you know, they're trying to get these high positions of power so they can actually make change in their mind. So I think the writing could have been tightened up a bit. But uh, I still overall, I think, like the motivation. I, I thought it was surprising and kind of interesting. Yeah, I think it's just a writing thing. If it had been more developed earlier on in the story, it wouldn't have stood out to me. It just felt very forced in the final episode. Like, hey, we got to get this last little bit of dialogue out there. That way the motivations seem a bit more innocent. I did like, though, at the same time that they had that kind of like darkly sweet moment between this villainous alien queen who watching her in the body actually cry as she's like holding Peacemaker's face and like genuinely thanking him for showing her kindness and feeding her whenever she was in the jar is kind of like oh wow like so she was she was being pretty genuine i think in terms of like i want you to help us i think you know we have the same goals and we align on things and we want peace so we can work together so i thought that was kind of this weird sweet moment and it kind of i don't know it makes peacemaker kind of like this lovable doof and whenever he leaves goff alive just for uh, her to come back at the end to feed her the last of the honey in like the final shot of the show. I thought that was a, yeah, I don't know, just like a different thing that you would expect from like a villain hero type relationship. And I, I really liked it. And I also liked how earlier in that episode, um, Adebayo had been like, you got to get past your guilt from your childhood. That's not like a way to live your life. And so I, I liked by him going against the butterflies, just kind of him moving on from all the, all of his childhood stuff. I thought all that stuff was really great with the end of the show. All right, guys, so I feel like we've talked a lot about the villains, the comedy, the drama, all the relationships, all that stuff, but we all here love a badass action sequence, and I thought this show had that in spades. Any standout action scenes for you guys? Any standout moments in particular? Let me know. I thought the fight scene with the um, the mullet girl in the yes. premiere episode was really oh, fun, God, how yeah. it's like they're going through walls, but it starts off with him using a vibrator as a microphone. Like that, Just everything about that <laughs> sequence was so fun to me. Yeah, I was going to say that one too, Austin. That was one of my favorite moments. And then the, the sonic boom moment with her too. Crazy. It was insane. Watching like a naked John Cena in his underwear, surrounded by like this blue force field, is like everything around him <laughs> explodes was such a funny visual. Uh, I guess I like the, the ending battle scene too. Uh, whenever Cena is throwing a shield and shooting it in a way that it like stabs everybody awesome. in the head. Awesome. That fight had the coolest choreography and I liked how it was a wide shot too. So you see all three of them uh, fighting together amongst all the butterflies. It felt like something I like out of the raid when he's like surrounded by all the other martial arts people. I thought it was great. I also, I wonder, I wish I could ask James Gunn. I wonder if originally that sequence had a different like badass 80s song, but then after like the previous weeks leading up, they saw like, how the theme song of the show and like the like the intro itself like was trending so hard they're like ah eh, fuck it let's just re-edit this scene and throw in the song from the intro because that was like fist bumping whenever like they just played that song again as they're like slow mo walking up but yeah I mean I guess it kind of ties into the action but I don't know I thought they really built tension well there I really thought both vigilante and Harcourt were dying in that scene like I was like oh, whenever you hear like the like, vigilante stand there and you just hear like the shot and he doesn't move it's like oh no no our boy. <laughs> and then he just like throws a knife backwards while fall while collapsing at the same time. Like Harcourt's choking on blood. It's like, oh my God, what's happening? When he comes back, he's like, What's up, guys? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah never he just happened. walks back. He just walks back into frame. <laughs> All right. So we talked about the uh the barn sequence there, which of course was like the big staple of the finale. And we don't have to spend too much time on it, but because 
you know, finales kind of make or break a show. We talked about the reveal and the motivations behind the butterflies and the resolution to that. Just like real quick, do you guys think the finale as a whole kind of stuck the landing? Do you think it was a strong episode? Are you feeling good about moving forward with the show now that we've seen it? Or was it kind of like a Book of Boba Fett situation where it was kind of like a weaker episode and kind of left a sour taste in your mouth? I don't know if I would call it weaker. Um, I, I don't think the finale did anything to surprise me other than seeing Jason Momoa pop up with dialogue. I thought that was a fun moment. Um, I, I think once, like I kind of said in my opening thoughts, once you know like the whole uh, general mystery of the show, it, it, it does get a little bit predictable. Like, of course, they're going to go stop him and the invasion's going to be preempted and, and all that. Um, but I thought the execution was fine. I just wasn't surprised by the finale. Yeah, I think it, it wrapped up in an all right way. And like you said, Austin, I was surprised that the Justice League showed up. But I did like seeing his line whenever he's like, you guys are fucking too late. Um, I think the main thing I actually liked, though, was um, whenever Abadayo calls out her mom on the news. I kind of like oh, that. Yeah. That was pretty big. Yeah, it's actually a really good point because I definitely didn't expect going into this show that even the finale of all things would have I mean that that's a really huge thing on like the DC universe. I mean also at the beginning you talked about how it's not that connected, but that was one of those things that surprised me because like you would think at this point because of that they can't do a traditional Suicide Squad sequel now if like Task Force X, Amanda Waller have been exposed to this level. So I'm kind of excited because it feels like if we're going to explore like that core group of like Ratcatcher, Bloodsport, King Shark, Harley Quinn, it's not going to be in the context of like a Suicide Squad team because you would assume that now can't be done because like the government will be on to Amanda Waller. And then if we see Peacemaker and the crew come back, they won't have those chains on them. So that was like a really great moment for Adebayo's character. And also like I wonder where that's going to pay off in the future. Well, and I think if you remember at the end of um, the Suicide Squad movie, the rest of the crew, Harley and all them, were were done with Waller. They mm-hmm. they actively defied the mission, and then, of course, their behind-the-scenes team knocked out Waller. Um, so it, it might make it more interesting for another Suicide Squad um, project to see Waller dealing with the public backlash, but then also trying to round up these villains that got away from her. I think overall, for me, the finale, for the most part, stuck the landing. I thought the comedy was especially weak in the opening half, but I don't know. I was just a sucker for once they started that assault. It was so badass. And like I already said, those character moments between him and Goff did not expect it all and really was satisfied by the resolution to the father son stuff, the butterflies. And like you already mentioned, Keith, it was just that that just a beautifully lit and framed shot of him sitting on that porch at the end with eagerly in the frame. But then you see Goff stepping up the last of the food and then the ghost of Peacemaker's dad just sits down smiling next to him. And it's like, God, we're in for some more like fucked up stuff next time, which I can't wait. Um, but speaking of next time, uh, ahead of the finale last night, they actually did go ahead and confirm uh, that HBO Max has greenlit a second season with Cena, of course, returning and James Gunn, apparently this time writing and directing all of the episodes. So I don't know if that's going to stick. Maybe they'll get other people to come in like they did this time. But regardless, after he finishes shooting Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, he will be returning to the world of DC. He has also mentioned he is interested in developing series for HBO Max based on other characters he introduced in the Suicide Squad. So despite that, if you want to talk about that a little bit, go for it. But let's focus first of all and foremost, what are your guys' hopes for a season two of Peacemaker? Yeah, I think I want season two to be more tied, not to the broader DC universe, but at least tied to the Suicide Squad characters. I kind of want to see where he's at with the rest of the team that he worked with. I want to see how Harley feels about Rick Flagg's death. I want to see kind of him having to deal more with the choices he made um, in the Suicide Squad movie, not just internally, but within like the actual other team members that he knows and has interacted with. Yeah, I just hope we get more of his backstory, like we said, with his dad being there at the end, kind of foreshadows maybe some more flashbacks with his childhood. I, and I would also like to get, like I said earlier, get more backstory on the rest of the uh, the Project Butterfly team members, like Harcourt, because it seems like she has a really interesting history of just the way she kind of carries herself but we really didn't get much of it i hope amanda waller has more of a presence too i want to see her and um at a bio interact more especially after she got exposed yeah i mean they have so many options i mean they've kind of set it up they could do a season with amanda waller as the main villain and they're all just kind of either going up against her they're just on the run or something i don't know I'd also, at this point, now that we've seen these episodes and I love them, I would be totally fine if they just had to bring the team together again for like another crazy 
a project or threat doesn't necessarily have to be aliens, but it's basically like you get the call from Harcourt and some shit's going down. The team's get there again. Let's go take it on. I'd be fine if it was just that. But I think I would lean to what you're saying, Austin. I think does it does it have to be the main plot? I don't think so. But in my perfect season two, I'd like for them just to it starts out just setting up like a new mission. They get the team back together again, like I said. But then slowly as the season goes on, maybe you find out that um, somehow Bloodsport, King Shark, Ratcatcher, and Harley Quinn, they have to be brought into the fold somehow. And it'd be really cool, like you said, to see him have to reconcile his actions against the team last time around because they're not going to be happy with him. Bloodsport and Harley Quinn were really close with Rick Flagg. And then, you know, King Shark and Ratcatcher are obviously really close to those two. So I don't know. Do I want to see like them go up against each other? I'm not sure, but I'm with you that I want to see them tie in the events of the Suicide Squad a lot more in season two. I think I do kind of also want to see him end up in a situation where he has to fight Aquaman because he <laughs> seems to have a very personal grudge against Aquaman. That joke about him banging fish came up quite a bit in this show. Aquaman too. Peacemaker's the main villain. Just think about My man! <laughs> All right. Well, of course, before we close out of here, we have to do the coveted Arnie's Podcast Award. Uh, Peacemaker may be getting all kinds of buzz, but I know the only thing that John Cena and James Gunn are going to care about figuring out which members of the show got an Arnie's Podcast Award. Completely. Completely. I got one. It's going to be the Bugs Life Award. And that goes to the cow. Because that thing, when I first saw it, I was like, what is that? It looks like a <laughs> giant, giant grub worm or caterpillar or something <laughs> i thought it looks so weird face definitely looks like something out of bug's life for sure <laughs> yeah i loved how they kind of made it sweet looking because it just had the one little baby tooth <laughs> it was kind of cute <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna give uh i think we're just gonna call this the slurp slurp award and uh it's the most unexpected thing i thought i would see in this show and that's the first time you see the uh senator's families drink the honey you know the way their Ugh. draws drop down and, and their tongues come out it's very unsettling every time you see it, and they're uh, slurp slurping up that honey. And mine is the best secret identity, and it of course goes to Adrian Chase as Vigilante. I don't know about you guys, but there was never any moment where I ever thought that this young man with glasses was this secret killing machine, that if you ever smoke weed, he might have to murder you as well. More Vigilante, please, by any cause. Maybe we'll get a Vigilante show. Maybe we'll see his cowboy roots. I want to see the moment that he decided to have I'm a Barbie girl as his cell phone ringtone. <laughs> <laughs> all righty. So with that, everybody, we're wrapping up our Peacemaker thoughts. Thank you all so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you hit that follow button so you never miss our upcoming content. Also, if you wouldn't mind sharing us with a friend, we really would appreciate that to continue to grow our show. Please leave us reviews as well. Even if you don't want to write anything, leaving us a five-star review over on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or you ever get your podcasts really does help us out. At The Arnie's is our social, and thearnies.media is the website. We'll be back on Tuesday for a brand new retrospective and review series. I think it's our first of 2022, if I remember right. We have Matt Reeves and Robert Pattinson's The Batman coming out in a couple weeks. So next week, we'll be doing our biggest retrospective and review yet, and we will be talking about the previous iterations of The Cape Crusader. Which actors are our favorites? Which versions do we not love? And what do we hope for this newest entry? Guys, how are you feeling about this? I'm excited for this one. This will be my first time uh, seeing the George Clooney Batman oh. in its entirety. So oh, no. I'm excited to expand my Batman palette with some bat nipples. Ooh, I used oh, to meet man. you. <laughs> Did someone leave the fridge open? Oh, no. Oh, wait. Well, Keith, what about our favorite line? <clears throat> hey, Freeze. I'm Batman. <laughs> I can't wait to go back and watch that one. Uh, I'm on the Michael Keaton, uh, second Michael Keaton one right now, Batman Returns. Mm -hmm. But I'll, I'll save my thoughts for that, for the show. Okay, okay. You don't want to spoil our Danny DeVito thoughts just yet? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> or Christopher Walken. <laughs> oh, God, I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, and lastly, we want to hear from you, so please send us a message on Instagram at the Arnie's or email us thearniesmedia at gmail.com. What did you think of Peacemaker? Do you think you could stand Vigilante if you had to deal with him in person? Anything you say we'll read on the show and react to it live on our latest episode. All right, everybody. That's Peacemaker for you. So have a great rest of your week. We'll be back next time with Peacemaker's number one uh, DC superhero, Batman. Um, but in the meantime, just want to make sure Austin and Keith knows um, you guys are both in the top three of my best friends and my BFFs. Uh, I won't spoil the ranking, but uh, we'll talk about it in, uh, next time. <laughs> Oh, well, good thing that. we're your only friends, so that <laughs> we're the only two you had to rank. Oh.
Oh no. 